Rise up as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we bless your name for the worship service. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for the victory that Jesus Christ won for every one of us on the cross of Calvary. We pray that in practical terms, every day of our lives, that victory will be ours in Jesus' name. We we'll pray, Lord, that the blood that cleansed us, washed us, will also protect us all the days of our lives in Jesus' name. He said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. I will pray that every evil thing will pass over every child of God in Jesus' name. As we are associated and attached and affiliated with the Lord Jesus Christ by the new birth. We pray, Lord, that the life of Christ will flow into every one of us and the victory of Christ will flow into every one of us in Jesus' name. Open our eyes of understanding this day that we might behold and see the wondrous and wonderful things of preserved for us in your word and make us the victor as a result of taking in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. We can sit down. We're looking at John chapter 15. In John chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 5. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. As we look at that, and he says, I am the vine, and ye are the branches. You remember that Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry, when he wanted to teach a very deep lesson, and he wanted to give a very supernatural instruction. He'll use what we know, what we have seen, and what we can understand very well to tell us things in heaven, or things spiritual, or things spirit supernatural that we didn't know before. And as he talked to the children of Israel and he spoke and he's speaking to us, he's talking about a tree. And he says, This tree is the vine. And then he says, the tree has branches. I think everybody can understand that. It's telling us that as the branch is attached to the tree, even so the believer, the child of God, is attached unto him, the Christ, our Savior. It's telling us then that there is no distance, there's no separation between Christ, the Savior, and the children of God who are the saved. And there's a close intimate relationship between Christ, our Redeemer, and then the children of God who are the redeemed. There's a close relationship between the sanctifier and the sanctified. There's a close relationship between our Lord and Savior and the people that have come to him. John chapter 15 verse 5, I am the vine. And that's the forever I am. As you look at John, you'll see many times when he says, I am. I am the resurrection and the life. And then immediately he says, because I live, he shall live also. Which means every time he says, I am, there is something that follows with, for the child of God. I am the door. And then immediately he says, by me, if any man will enter in, he'll find pasture, he'll find the peace of God, he'll find things eternal. He says, I am. He is the life. I am the life. He is the resurrection. I am the resurrection. He is the door. I am the door. He said, I am the shepherd. And then he said, I give my life for the sheep. As you go through the gospel according to St. John, you are going to find many places where it says, I am, I am, I am. And here he now says, I am the vine. And then immediately he follows and he says, and ye are the branches. That means we're all the time attached to him, morning and evening. And dry season and rainy season. And whatever may be happening in life, we're so attached unto him. The question then is, how do you become a branch in the vine? Very important because it says, when we were in sin, we were separated from the Lord. But not because he died for us. And because he shed his blood, and that blood gives us forgiveness and grants us salvation, eternal life. It is that blood he shed, it's that sacrifice he made, and it is that atonement he made that has taken us away from where we were. And now he brings us close to himself. 
that now we're reconciled unto God. We are part of Him and we're part of His life. I am the vine and ye are the branches. And then it says, He that abideth in me. He that abideth in me. That word abide means to stay in me. To remain in me. I was just saying there. It says, Yes, I have the responsibility to keep you. You also have the responsibility to want to be kept. I am the vine. Ye are the branches. He that abideth in me. You came. You repented. You must remain and then be righteous. You must abide. He that abideth in me. And I in him. He said, the same bringeth forth. What? Much fruit. The reason why we came to know the Lord is not just to be saved. There are people who think, I am saved, I am saved. And then we say, what else? What else is happening to you? What else is happening in your life? What else? What are you living for? Here it says, because we are branches in the vine. There is one purpose for which we are branches. And there is one thing the Lord intends. And there is one result he wants to bring out of, of our lives. He says, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Then he says, for without me ye can do nothing. Getting saved is wonderful. By faith in Christ. Remaining saved is more wonderful. By faith in Christ. So that we remain in it. Because without him we cannot do anything. That's why the prayer life is very important. That's why obedience is very important. That's why staying with the Lord is very important. In fact, it says if one stay with him, something is going to happen. It tells us in verse 6. If a man abide not in me. If a man abide not in me. And there are some people that think that after we are born again, we don't have any choice anymore. We just remain with the Lord forever. There are people that think that once you are saved, you don't have any free will, any choice. You are there, you are there. No, it says, you still have your free will. You can decide to stay. You can decide to go. You can decide to remain. You can decide to be separated. It says, if you will use your free will, and then you stay with me, abide with me. You're going to be a fruit. It says, but if you use your free will the wrong way, the wrong direction, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burnt. I pray that you will not be your Lord. I said, I pray that you will not be your Lord. That you remain with the Lord, you keep on bearing fruit, and that fruit that you are bearing will keep on abiding in Jesus' name. It comes back to those of us who are remaining, it comes back to you and to me in verse 7. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, he is telling us now how to abide in him. There are some people that are saying, How do I abide in Christ? How do I remain in Christ? How can I be sure I'm still abiding in Christ? It says, you abide in me, my words abide in you. That's how to abide in Christ. Because there's no separation between Christ and the word. In fact, the Bible says in the gospel according to St. John, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And that word became flesh. That is, he is identified with the word, equated with the word. And so he says, when I say you abide in me, all I mean is abide in my word. If you abide in my word while you abide in me, then he shall ask what he will. And it shall be done unto you. Herein is my father glorified that she bear much fruit. We're in the kingdom to glorify the Lord, to exalt, to honor the Lord. And the way we exalt him, honor him, glorify him, is to bear fruit. And then it says, so shall ye be my disciples. I'm looking at the word of God today, which you glorifying God through spiritual fruitfulness. Glorifying God through spiritual fruitfulness. You have come into the kingdom for such a time as this. That's what the Lord, that, that's what uh, Mordecai told Esther. And he said, this is a time of need in the nation. A time of need in the kingdom. 
And you, you have come into the kingdom for such a time as this. We're getting near the coming of the Lord, the end of time, the end of the age, the end of the world. And we're living at such a time that the Almighty God wants fruit bearing. He wants the fruit of righteousness. There is no righteousness in the world. It appears that everybody, everywhere is dark. Everywhere is gloomy. Everywhere is a kind of fruitless. And it appears that the Lord is saying, because there's so much darkness, I want some light. I want people to see some light. There's so much sin, so much unrighteousness, and there's so much evil. There's so much corruption. And he wants to see that fruit of righteousness everywhere. And that is how we bring glory unto him. He says, herein is my father glorified that she bear much fruit. Uh, we need to understand what he's talking about when he says we bear much fruit. We're looking at Matthew chapter 3. In Matthew chapter 3, I'm looking at verse 8. Bring forth therefore fruits, meat suitable for repentance. Bring forth therefore fruit, meat for repentance. That's how the Father will be glorified when you become like Zacchaeus. He had been a great sinner. And then he came to know the Lord. And while the Lord was going home with him, he said, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. If I take anything by wrong accusation, I restore it fourfold. That's, that's the fruit of repentance. He has repented and therefore that fruit is coming out of his life now. And the Lord is saying, he's not seen that too much in the world. And he wants to see that. It's not seen too much of that in the church world, in churchianity, in Christendom. Many people just go to church and they come out and there's no fruit of repentance. And the Lord is saying, if you want to glorify me, bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. If that is what the Lord is looking for in your life and in my life, we ought to make that seen so that the people around us will know that we have come to know the Lord and they can see that that fruit is there. We're looking at Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 22. It says, but the, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. The Almighty God is saying, I've sent my Spirit into the world. And I've sent my Spirit into the church in particular, that He will always abide with you. I want to see the fruit of the presence of the Spirit of God in the church, in the believer. And the fruit is love. You see, there's so much hatred in the world, and so much bitterness, and so much malice, and so much conflict, and so much war, intertribal war. War almost everywhere, church against church, church against other religions. And the Lord is saying, but I sent my spirit into the church, and to the believers, so I can see some fruit. And it says, herein is the Father glorified that we bear much fruit of love. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and long suffering as patience. And there's no fruit of patience in the world. Everybody is in a hurry. Everybody is impatient. We want this and we want it now. But the Lord is saying, I've sent my Spirit to you so you can bear fruit in your life. I want to see that fruit and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance against such there is no law. We're looking at Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 22. Herein is my father glorified that she bear much fruit. What fruit? The fruit of repentance. What fruit? The fruit of the spirit. In Romans chapter 6 verse 22. But now be made free from sin. And become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto, unto what? Unto holiness. Looks like, you know, when you believe in holiness, you might be feeling lonely. As if we are the only one. Believe in holiness. Practical holiness. Inward holiness. Heartfelt holiness. Holiness that comes by grace and by the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb. And the Lord is don't feel lonely. Don't feel that you're all alone. That's exactly what I want to see. Herein is my Father glorified that she bear much fruit. The fruit of 
holiness and you, you know sometimes as a member of the church when you're feeling lonely and you're feeling we're all alone you are the only people proclaiming and emphasizing this holiness without which no man shall see the lord and you're almost wishing that the church will change a little bit so that we can be acceptable to the people of the world and we can be acceptable to all the other churches if we can bring in some other things that they do but god says no the reason the branch is attached to the vine is so that you'll bear much fruit. And that fruit is the fruit of holiness, but now being made free from sin and, became, and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. We're looking at Philippians chapter 1. I'm just showing you the kind of fruit the Lord is expecting. That if we have come to know the Lord, it says, they say you are going to glorify God, honor God, exalt God, worship God, praise the name of the Lord, because you are bearing fruit. What kind of fruit? Fruit of repentance, and fruit of righteousness, and fruit of holiness, and fruit of the Spirit. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 11, being filled for the fruits of righteousness. The word field there is very important. It says, I, I, I'll be glorified. I'll be exalted. I'll be sanctified in the midst of the temple, in the midst of the sanctuary, in the midst of my people. When they are filled with righteousness, and they're so filled, there is no place, there's no space for any other thing. Think about that. That we're so filled with the fruit of righteousness it's like you go to the farm and you harvest the fruits different kinds of fruits and you put them in the basket and the basket is so full there's no space for any other thing and the lord is saying herein is my father glorified that you are so filled and you're so full of the fruits of righteousness there is no space for any other sin. That's what glorifies God. Look at that again. Verse 11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and the praise of God. Hebrews chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 11. Hebrews chapter 12. And I'm reading from verse 11. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them, which are exercised thereby. The Lord is here saying that the farmer produces fruit in many, various ways, cultivating the land, putting manure into the ground, and cutting off the useless branches, and removing the weeds, doing quite a lot of things. And here it's saying that the Almighty God also does the same thing. He will prune us, and trim us, and correct us, and instruct us, and encourage us, and do everything necessary. And sometimes some of those things he does may not be very just may not make us very happy and then it says but afterward it brings forth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby and that is what brings glory unto God in James chapter 3 I'm reading from verse 18 James chapter 3 verse 18 and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace uh, have you seen how peace and righteousness go together? If there is no peace, there cannot be any righteousness. If we're full of contention and struggling and, and fighting and competition, you want this, I want that too, and 